It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I'd like to bring Steve Heimler up. He is going to preach to us on prayer and forgiveness. And so Steve, come on up. Thank you, man. It is awesome to see you. Thank you. Oh, there we go. There. That was yep. beautiful. That no, was good. It was good. Just how we rehearsed it. Hey, I'm Steve. It's good to see you. Uh, good to see you all. Yeah. Uh, today, we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter, of, chapter 11. Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, starting in verse 2. And Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the last few weeks, as Nick mentioned, we've been considering this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, what we traditionally call the Lord's Prayer. And this week we're going to focus on verse 4. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted against us. Now, when I became a Christian at the age of 17, the fresh age of 17, uh, I started going to a church, you know, just actually down the road, and it had as part of its normal Sunday liturgy for all of us to stand and recite the Apostles' Creed together. And every week we would stand together and we would say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and on and on. And this young Christian with about as much wisdom as a walnut, I, I chafed at this practice. I didn't like it. I thought it felt rote and mechanical, and the whole room speaking together sounded like, like drones, like mechanical drones without emotion, but it wasn't until actually much later in my life that I realized the subtle genius of what was taking place when we stood together and said these things out loud. Each Sunday, we stood and we recited together the most fundamental beliefs that we held. Each Sunday, we reminded ourselves and each other what was the irreducible minimum of our shared faith. And I didn't understand that because we are such forgetful creatures, we needed to be reminded of those beliefs every time we gathered, lest we drift away into a faith of our own making. So now, you know, looking back, I see that practice as beautiful. But at this point in my life, something else in that creed has plunged me into a mystery. So if you know this creed, you know the third stanza goes like this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Now, what in the world is that doing there? I mean, you know, think about where it falls in the creed. Like it's in the third stanza, which deals with the people of God. You know, first stanza deals with God the Father, and he's the creator. Then the second stanza is Christ and his atonement and all of that. Third stanza is the Holy Spirit, but it's all about the people of God, the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the resurrection of our bodies, right? It's talking about our bodies. Resurrection of Christ's body was in the second stanza. So right in the middle there it says, the, we believe in the forgiveness of sin. So when it says that, it's not merely or even primarily talking about God's forgiveness of our sins, but we are standing and stating that we believe in forgiving each other's sins. Now, of course, God's forgiveness of sins is within that as well. But what we are primarily saying is that we stand, we believe in the forgiveness of each other's sins. The creed, it's crazy. The, the, this creed, it, it deals with these soaring realities of, of God's character, of his creation, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, the spirit of God, the resurrection, the global church. And then right in the middle of the third stanza, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I, for, I believe in forgiving other people. And the mystery to me is a 
Of course I believe that. Of course, we, like, that's a given, right? Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? We forgive other people. But the people who composed that creed thought that it was not a given. The people who composed that creed apparently assumed that we needed to be reminded that we believe in the forgiveness not only of our sins by God, but of forgiving each other's sins every time we gather for worship. And the more I reflected on it, I believe, at least, you know, for my part, they were right. This is so easy to forget. And the reason why they were right is because of another shocking revelation that came to me as I meditated over this week's texts, namely Jesus teaching us that we pray that, that God forgives us as we forgive one another. And this revelation was pretty clear that God forgives my sins on the condition that I forgive others their sins. Now, I know how that sounds. Um, it sounds like I'm saying that we earn our forgiveness, and that's about as opposed to the teaching of the New Testament as anything else that I know. That is not what I'm saying. We do not earn forgiveness. It is unearnable. It is unbuyable. Forgive, God's forgiveness of our sins cannot be paid for. That's what I'm saying. But what I am saying is what Jesus is saying is that God forgives my sins on the condition that I forgive others their sins. And if we don't understand this, we don't understand the dynamic of what Jesus is trying to teach us in this moment, the results will be disastrous. Like thinking we have received God's forgiveness of our sins, we really will have rejected it. And in the end, we will shipwreck our faith. So, as hard as that is to understand right now at this moment in the sermon, stay with me and I'll explain what I mean under four headings. Number one, the condition of God's forgiveness. Number two, the economy of forgiveness. Number three, the practice of forgiveness. And number four, the gospel of forgiveness. So the condition, the economy, the practice, and the gospel. Number one, the condition of forgiveness. So my claim here, let me state it again, is that Jesus teaches us that God's forgiveness is conditioned by our acts of forgiveness. If we don't forgive, we will not be forgiven. And Jesus teaches us that this is, this is a reality that we go to God in prayer for. Like this, is, this is something, forgive us. We are making a request of God. We, we, Jesus teaches us to come to God and request that this system, this scenario be applied to us. That's what the Lord, that's what he's saying in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive. How do we pray? You pray like this. Now, look at the text from Luke. Luke eleven four. Lest you think I'm making this up. And forgive us our sins, he says. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted against us. Now, that's just a softer version of how he puts it in Matthew's gospel in chapter 6, verse 12. He says, and forgive us our debts, still in the context of the Lord's Prayer, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And then what's kind of astonishing in Matthew's version of this prayer is that after Jesus delivers the prayer, the, the, he says, Here, here's how you pray. Jesus actually takes two verses after he gives the prayer to make commentary on one of the clauses in the prayer. He doesn't take time to comment on, you know, hallowed be your name, the hallowed name of God, even though, you know, in the Old Testament, we, we know, if you've read it, that the name of God is of great concern to him. Jesus doesn't comment on that clause. Jesus doesn't comment on the clause of the coming of the kingdom, even though arguably there are more verses, more pieces, more of the narrative in the Old Testament about the kingdom of God, even than the name of God. Jesus doesn't comment on that, even though it is a major theme of scripture. No, he takes two verses to comment about the phrase on forgiveness. And he says this, so he just said, remember we just read in verse 12, Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven our debtors. And then he makes commentary on that two verses later. Verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. It's, it's like Jesus thinks that we'll read that part of the prayer in the Lord's Prayer and think, you know, the, the forgive us as we forgive others, and we'll be tempted to conclude, no, he can't mean that. That, there must be, it must be like, you know, and the preacher says, it's like, well, the Greeks, and it's like, no, there's not, there, we might be tempted to think that. I, I hate to tell you, but you go to the commentaries on these verses, there's not any, there's not like a weird Greek word that's like, oh, it could go lots of different ways. It's pretty clear. But Jesus gives that temptation to think that we, you know, to, to believe that he couldn't possibly mean that. He gives that temptation no quarter. He could not be clearer as he makes this comment. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. If you do not forgive others, God will not forgive you. God's forgiveness, therefore, is conditional upon our forgiveness of others. And this teaching, I hate to tell you, this is, it's not just found here in the Lord's Prayer. In Mark, you remember J Jesus goes to Jerusalem and he curses the fig tree and he turns that into a lesson on prayer and he says this in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that, so that, your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And then in Luke 6, Verse 37, Jesus is teaching about loving your enemies. He says this, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So the clear teaching of Jesus is this. God forgives our sins on the condition that we forgive others their sins. And that means that our forgiveness of others is a matter of life and death. Forgiveness of others has a crucial bearing on our citizenship in the kingdom of God like few other things do. And so you begin to see why the composers of the Apostles' Creed thought that it was necessary for us to remind ourselves of this reality every time we were together. But, okay, if you've been a Christian for more than five minutes, you're likely feeling some tension at this point. That's not what we were taught. We were taught that God's forgiveness is free and it cannot be earned. And I want to affirm that belief. That is indeed the unequivocal and clear teaching of the New Testament. And yet, Jesus tells us that God's forgiveness is conditioned on our forgiveness of others. So, what is going on here? Well, that leads us to number two, the economy of forgiveness. So in order to understand this, let's spend some time in a parable that Jesus taught concerning this very subject. Right before the passage that we're about to look at, Jesus explains to his disciples how hurts inflicted between brothers and sisters uh, and wounds, you know, how those things are supposed to be handled. And then Peter raises a question about it. In Matthew 18, verse 21, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In other words, Peter is asking, Jesus, what is the limit for me to forgive others their sins? And Peter's suggestion was that it was seven times, which honestly is actually you know, pretty generous since the, uh, the, the general, generally accepted teaching, Jewish teaching of the day was that you only, the, the upper limit is three. You forgive people three times. And so Peter is like adding four. It's pretty generous. But Jesus says, no. 77 times. And without getting into the weeds, essentially what he's saying is there is no limit to forgiveness. There is no upper limit to forgiveness. And then he tells a story to help us understand why. Verse 23 of Matthew 18. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent was something like 20 years wages uh, for a working person. And you know, I've read several historians of the ancient Near East who say that, I mean, this is a parable. This is not, you know, these are not real numbers, but that that was essentially 10,000 talents was more wealth than even existed in all of the ancient Near East at that time. The point is, it's an astonishing amount, an amount that none of us could ever truly, you know, grasp. The point is, uh, he tells us the point as he goes on. Verse 25, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold. His, with his wife and his children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. So the master does what any person would do in a culture, who, in this kind of culture, who would be owed a debt that could not be paid. He enacts justice. You can't pay, thus you are to be sold along with your family so that I can recoup at least something of the debt. And the indebted servant knew that this is how the world worked. This was the economy in which they existed. He knew that when his master called him to account, his family would be sold because he could not pay the debt. That was the economy of debt and repayment in that age, the economy of justice. Debt required payment. And as long as you lived in that economy of justice, justice would be applied to you. But the servant asks for an astonishing grace. Just, just give me a little time. Give me a little longer and I will pay you everything. Now, because that amount was so massive unimaginably huge. The master knew that no matter what the servant did, he could not repay this debt. And so here's where something astonishing happens. The master brings that servant out of the economy of justice and plunges him into the economy of forgiveness. A great transfer has occurred for this servant. The master pities the servant. The master is moved by the servant's plight and forgives him the debt. The ledger is wiped clean. It is gone, abolished, and now the servant is free. The servant now lives in the economy of forgiveness. Except that he really doesn't. Because watch what happens next. Verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down, fellow servant, excuse me, fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. And he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So though this servant had been ushered by his master into the economy of forgiveness, the servant refused to live in it and chose instead to remain in the economy of justice. Do you see this? He demands a pittance, a hundred denarii, very small amount. He demands 100 denarii from this fellow servant and the fellow servant pleads with him in almost the exact same words that that servant used with the master. Have patience with me and I'll pay you. But the servant refused. He refused to live in the economy of forgiveness and mercy into which he had been plunged and instead enacted justice. It didn't matter to him that the master had forgiven his great debt. In his mind, that merciful reality that had been applied to him was separate from the reality between him and this other servant. He was owed money that the man couldn't pay, so he did what any lender would do to a debtor who was not paying him. He threw him in debtor's prison until he should pay. But there's something completely incongruent with that behavior. Watch what happens, verse 31. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And then they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. 
Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave all that debt, forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have, have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Now, pay careful attention. In verse 31, it says that his fellow servants who witnessed what the other servant did, the unforgiving servant, it says that they were greatly distressed. Now, why would they be distressed? The servant only did what was just to his fellow servant. That is how the world worked. They were distressed because they understood something that the forgiven servant did not understand. They understood that when the master transferred the servant out of the economy of justice and into the economy of mercy and forgiveness, that shift on the master's part required an equal shift on the servant's part. Are you following? It's as if the master is saying, when you live in the realm of forgiveness, you cannot simultaneously live in the realm of justice. To accept entrance into the realm of mercy means to forsake citizenship in the realm of justice. And that's exactly what the master says in this, um, in this parable. He says, I had mercy on you, and should you not have had mercy on others? This is how it works in the new reality. To receive mercy is to be plunged into an economy of forgiveness and to live there you must do to others as I have done to you. That is the law of this new reality of grace and forgiveness. But the servant, refusing to forgive his fellow servant, even a small amount proved to the master that he did not desire to live in the economy of forgiveness. He rejected it for the economy of justice. And so the master gave the servant what he wanted. If that is the place you want to live, if you want to live in the economy of justice, then you may have it. He was thrown into prison until he could pay an unpayable debt. And just in case we're not clear on the implications, Jesus, our Lord, says this in verse 35, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So do you see why Jesus is so emphatic throughout the Gospels and the Lord's Prayer itself that we must forgive if we ourselves are to expect forgiveness because the forgiveness of our sins is contingent upon our forgiving others their sins and here's why. God's forgiveness of our sins is free. Full stop, no equivocation. God's forgiveness is free. It cannot be purchased. But, and, and either stop listening right now and come back in three minutes or, or, or listen carefully because this is nuanced and needs to be heard. There is a kind of payment required to receive that forgiveness. We don't pay for the forgiveness, but there's a payment required to receive the forgiveness, and that payment is called repentance. Repentance. Now pay close attention here. I just said God's forgiveness cannot be purchased, and yet repentance is kind of a payment. Here's what I mean. Though the cost of forgiveness was entirely borne by Christ in his own body on the tree, and the offender, you and me, could not purchase it even if we tried, the offender must still pay something in the transaction in order to receive the forgiveness, and that currency is repentance. Repentance is not a currency which purchased the forgiveness itself, but rather a payment that creates the internal conditions that is able to receive forgiveness. And those internal conditions, or I should say condition, is called humility. And it's only humility which is capable of receiving forgiveness for free. Do you follow? We're good? Don't get tripped up here. Even the payment 
of repentance itself is a gift of grace, okay? We don't conjure it. We don't try really hard. We do not earn it, and nevertheless, it is required to receive the gift of forgiveness. Repentance means to change, and the change that is required is humility. And you know, if someone has ever forgiven you, uh, like I know, I can think of times in my own life, but if someone has ever forgiven you, especially of some significant transgression, you know the kind of change I'm talking about. You know the kind of change that enables us to receive that kind of forgiveness from another. When we're forgiven, we find ourselves astonished at the mercy of this other person and the largesse and the kindness that they offer us. And if we have truly received that forgiveness, it makes us want to magnify that person, magnify their mercy, to devote our lives to pleasing them, to making sure that such a transgression never occurs again. And that change is the change that repentance signifies. That is the change that the unforgiving servant did not enact. This is what the unmerciful servant missed. Forgiveness was offered, but he did not humble himself to receive it. And in that case, he did not receive it at all. Forgiveness, Jesus says, changes the one who is forgiven. It ought to change me from one who demands justice from others into one who extends mercy and forgiveness to others. And that can only happen through the grace of repentance and humility, which is the chief sign that I have received God's forgiveness for my sins in the first place. Which brings us to number three, the practice of forgiveness. So since the forgiveness of others is so paramount in God's economy of mercy, we need to think for a moment about how we enact that mercy that has so freely been bestowed upon us. So let me tell you what forgiveness is not, then let me tell you what forgiveness is. First, forgiveness is not forgetting. I hope this is, I hope this is almost axiomatic. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Think of the way the immune system works. Let's let's talk about the body for a second. It's actually quite astonishing. uh, And, you know, I'm just a, you know, preacher and a humble history teacher. So if there's like virologists in the room, forgive me. this, This is the basic understanding of the immune system. So a virus is introduced into the body and the immune system, you know, as the virus is attacking our cells, um, the immune system mounts a defense by creating, you know, white blood cells or sending white blood cells. I don't know what they do. Anyway, um, and that fights the infection and heals us from the deleterious effects of the virus. But after, listen, after the battle is won, our immune system creates a kind of memory for that virus, the shape of it, the, uh, that, that's all I know. The, and so that it, if it ever shows up again, the defenses will be ready and the sicknesses won't be nearly as severe. Like, it would be disastrous for our bodies if our immune system didn't keep these kinds of records of past assaults, right? And so our, our psychological selves are a lot like, you know, not all that different from our biological selves. The dynamics of the immune system exist to organize itself against future threats of the same kind. And when our psychological self is wounded, it mounts similar defenses against the person who struck the blow. I hope I don't have to prove this. We've all been hurt at some point. We know this, right? Our, we, we mount defenses against that person. And that self, like the immune system, is incapable of forgetting the wound and actually organizes itself to defend against future attacks from the same source. And that's a very good thing. When someone hurts you or traumatizes you or wounds you, your mind and your heart create barriers against them lest you be hurt or traumatized in the same way again. If you don't believe me, just pay attention to your body when you're in the presence of someone who hurts you. Your stomach flutters, shoulders tighten up, heart beats fast, 
you feel intuitively defensive against that person. That's your psychological self mounting a defense against a future attack. And that is a very good thing. Just like the immune system, that is a very good thing. That kind of memory saves us in many respects. It was said of Jesus that he did not entrust himself to men because he knew what was in men, humans. And if that kind of withholding and defensiveness is good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. It's good enough for us. So forgiveness is not the same thing as forgetting. In fact, as I'm about to argue, remembering is a key to forgiveness. Must remember. So then, that's what forgiveness is not. What is forgiveness? What does it mean to forgive another person and be forgiven by that other person? Listen carefully. Forgiveness is fundamentally an act of imagination whereby we reimagine our relationship to the hurt by assuming a new, larger identity than the self that suffered the transgression. I'm going to read that again. Forgiveness is fundamentally an act of imagination whereby we reimagine our relationship to the hurt by assuming a new, larger identity than the self that suffered the transgression. See, that smaller self, the one who was hurt, that's the one that still mounts a defense against any future hurt. And that smaller self is still useful to us in relationships so that we learn better whom to trust. But forgiveness becomes the task of an enlarged self, a self that has grown beyond the small self that was hurt. Our maturity now shines beams of light onto our past, which have before now been obscured by our immaturity. And in this reimagination, we recognize the grace of a story larger than the one whose contours of pain and betrayal shaped our former selves. So from this place of maturity, we are able to cover the hurt, cover the one who hurt us and the memories attached to the hurt with understanding. And that act of understanding is itself the act of forgiveness. We take into consideration all the extenuating circumstances that in many ways caused that person to act the way that they did. We consider the excuses for their actions, which in almost all cases are better than we assume. We excuse what can be excused and whichever bit is left over, which the excuses don't stretch to cover, we forgive. That means we reimagine our relationship to it. We no longer hold it in debt to ourselves, no longer in the economy of justice. The debt is canceled. And it doesn't mean we entrust ourselves to everyone again. That smaller self who was hurt is very useful to us but our larger selves are able to cancel the debt. And that act of imagination, in case we forgot, occurs in prayer. It occurs in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, which is why Jesus included this phrase about the forgiveness of sins in this prayer he taught us. And the almost magical thing about doing the work to forgive others in this way is that it makes us capable of receiving the forgiveness ourselves. Now, the Irish poet David White says that in the moments before death, the greatest desire of almost every person is the desire to be forgiven. And I think he's right. Every human being leads, it leaves at least some wreckage in their wake, some detritus in their relationships, Many things that cannot be excused, only forgiven. And those realities often become knowable only in the clarity of dying. And so the more that we forgive along the way, the larger we become in this new identity that is able to extend understanding and forgiveness and debt cancellation to those who wound us, the more we will become the kinds of people who have grown strong enough and, more to the point, humble enough 
as David White puts it, to receive at the very end that absolution ourselves. And the more we forgive, the humbler we become, which further enables us to receive the forgiveness of sins which God offers us at every turn. So the real question is, how do we mature into people capable of this enlarged, forgiving imagination? And that brings us to number four, the gospel of forgiveness, briefly. The way we become capable of forgiving others so that God may forgive our sins is remembering the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, did you notice in the parable the order of the events as they occurred? The indebted servant falls before the master and begs for mercy, and the master grants it. The master forgives him. So the forgiveness of the master was the first act that brought that servant into the economy of forgiveness, and so it is with us. It is written that from before the very foundation of the world, Christ was crucified. And before you and I were even born, God saw fit to send his only begotten son to be born in our likeness. And though he had borne no transgression, committed no transgression that required forgiveness, there was no sin found in him. He submitted his body to be crushed, his blood to be poured out. Why? For the forgiveness of our sins. Before we were born, before we could do anything to work for it, anything to earn it, he did this. And by that act, our Father has brought us, all of us who call upon his name, into the economy of Christ's everlasting mercy and grace and forgiveness. And he did this for free. He bore the cost himself and as the overflow of his abounding love for his children. And so you have to imagine yourself bearing the great debt of your sin into his presence, knowing that you have no currency with which to satisfy this debt. You have to imagine yourself ready to be crushed under the weight of justice, to be thrown into prison, as it were, until you are capable of paying an unpayable debt. Because what else do you and I deserve but then? You have to inhabit the astonishment that comes when your Father in heaven pities you. He is moved by your plight. He lifts your head and shows you the wounds of a son and says, all is forgiven. And the weight of that mercy will break the back of any but the most humble. And in that moment, you become a son of God, a daughter of God. Because all our brothers and sisters have been shown such mercy, we also show mercy to one another. That is the sign of sonship. That is the sign of daughterhood. And if you want to put it in the words of the apostle Paul, you are now in Christ. That is the new, larger identity that is capable of reimagining your relationship to those past hurts and bestowing upon those perpetrators the same mercy that has come upon you. You are not the same person who was hurt. You are not the same person who was hurt. You are larger, more complete, more mature. You are in Christ, a new creation. And so, brothers and sisters, let us leave here knowing that we live by grace in the economy of forgiveness, and then let us go extending that mercy and forgiveness to others. Now, we come to this table, as we do every week. This is a table of God's forgiveness in Christ, and if you want to know what forgiveness tastes like, it tastes like bread. It tastes like this cup. Every week we approach this table, if we're doing it properly, in fear and trembling, wondering if God's mercy will extend yet further over us. But every week when we come, we find that his garment of forgiveness has widened yet more, and he covers us in his grace. So as you come, remember the body that was broken and the blood that was spilled for your forgiveness, and then cry out for the grace of repentance, which will enable you to bring those who have hurt you into the economy of God's forgiveness in which we live. So, come and welcome to Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, 
What are we to say to such things? We ask that you would astonish us yet again with the largesse of your mercy, with the wideness of your forgiveness, and cover us again under the shelter of your wing. Shelter us again under the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Help us remember what we have forgotten, who we are, and would you grant us the pleasure of living in the economy of your forgiveness. Give us the pleasure of extending that mercy to those who have hurt us. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This meal is for those brothers and sisters who call on his name. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ.